The desert was infinity, loneliness, the insignificance of man, the contingencies of life, the persistence of life, life, life and bones and parasites and opportunists and madmen and genius in its simulacrum of a vacuum. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm excited to be doing a video on rereading The Manifold Destiny of Eddie Vegas by Rick Harsh. One of the occasions that prompted this, besides just the mere fact that roughly two years after first reading it, I was starting to get that pull back towards it, as I do with many of my favorite books. But another reason for this video is that it is now out in a U.S. edition by Zero Gram Press. Go out and buy yourself a copy if you haven't managed to get one already. If you don't know anything about this novel and you haven't seen my previous video or read my review that's adapted from the video on Splice, and you want to just get a sense of what my excitement for this novel is all about, I do suggest you go and watch my original video. I don't get too deep into anything in the book. I pretty much just cheer it on like some crazy literary pep rally. Everything I say is 100% sincere and true and still holds maybe even truer on this second reading. But if you don't want to hear too much about the story and about the characters and different plot developments and things like that, such as I'm going to do with this video, then I suggest you go and watch that one and read the book and then come back and watch this video. I'm going to do my best having rewatched that original video just this morning to steer away from things that I went into so that we don't overlap. First and foremost, in the very first page, we open with a hostility towards cliché. The narrator encounters someone as soon as they land in Los Angeles who offers a cliché about Los Angeles weather. And the narrator says to us, if you don't like cliches, don't return to the U.S. Furthermore, once we're closer to midway through the book, we have two characters, Donnie and Drake, talking to each other. And Drake starts to say, if I learned anything from my old man, what a cliché, let me rephrase. So we get explicitly in mid-sentence a character who's not even partnering necessarily directly with the narrator, forcing himself out of cliches. This is important to point out because it's very, very clear that Rick Harsh has a gift for not just avoiding cliches, but coining words, neologisms, and turns of phrase, and what Philip Friedenberg would later call word fevers that are so fresh and so inventive and creative that they themselves can never become cliché. And it's amazing because the book in its previous two editions is a little over 700 pages. In this Zero Gram Press edition, they have narrowed it down to about 620 pages. But that's mostly because of the form factor of the book being a little bit bigger and typesetting being tighter and our lists that we get, these Rabelaisian lists, are taken from their one column instantiation to a two column per page instantiation. As far as I can tell, there are no major cuts in the text, but all this to say that it's amazing that our writer here, Rick Harsh, is so adamant about avoiding cliché that for 600, 700 pages, he can actually do so and keep every single sentence of this narrative so fresh to our ears that just reading it is exhilarating for its obsession with the possibilities of our great language. And he takes it beyond just English strictly. Harsh is a bit of a linguist. He has a deft, keen, sharp ear for spoken languages in many different tongues. That is, 
he can put a combination of French and Spanish and Latin and English and whatever in the mouth of a Native American, or he can put Slovenian in the mouth of a Anglo-centric narrator to produce these interesting words and sounds. You can tell that as he was writing this, he had a, this metaphysical channel that just stays open and just scans for interesting possibilities with language as he's hearing or feeling from his gut the different passages, these different sentences, that channel that's scanning for interesting avenues and pathways that can be seized upon during the course of the narrative flow makes every sentence exciting, no matter what it's about. I found myself day after day when I would sit down to re-engage with this book, just excited to see how he would say something. You can really tell that Harsh has drunk deeply from the well of Joyce, a marasma of intarsic aspect, the condition of inescapable marasmic plight, a many-faceted chaotic stretch of rational illogicities. There are also ideas of comping and improvisation, such as you get in jazz music, where there will be a steady rhythm, a steady melody, but the drummer may do comping on the snare. That is sort of feeling and freely mixing in little strikes and notes in order to complement the other musicians instead of just playing, you know, something standard and simple all the way through. And the prose, it likewise often comps or complements the overall structure. It plays within the bounds set for it. Let's take this short paragraph as an example. You might say that it sounds like she knew immediately she would accept the invitation, and you would be right. She did, and then an M dash, but not without a gumbo of disgust, disdain, discombobulation, divergent derision, dread, even distemper. This is comping. Right in the first sentence, you might say that it sounds like, and it's almost like we're being cued that we're about to deal with sounds and experience sounds. And then right before that M dash, it says she did. And I think that that did, which begins and ends with the letter D, sets the parameters for this comping that's coming up. So she did. And then right on the heels of that, we're going to get disgust, disdain, discombobulation, divergent derision, dread, even distemper. And this is just so brilliant. And whether it was happening consciously for Harsh or not, this just shows me how attuned his ear is and how he can filter this into his writing in such a brilliant way. And if that isn't enough, the sentence that follows immediately after this paragraph begins with a staccato of C plosives or K plosives. Causation, of course, is quietly cacophonous. Let's take this sentence as a good example to kind of tie up my love for Harsh's use of language. Throughout his life, he farted simianly. He had no idea how frequently compared to others, but he farted what he took to be a verisimianitudinous norm in number and nature, in nurturing also normally, mostly as a teen. I like this passage not only because it is so loftily wrought, but it's loftily elevating in language the fact of the characters farting. So you've got this high and low together. Looking at it further, we get this announcement with the word simianly. Simian means of uh, apes or monkeys. Throughout his life, he farted simianly. And so he's already cued us with the context and the novel word he's going to use as his point of departure for riffing. And he says, I had no idea how frequently compared to others. So we've got the idea of simian and farting and frequency now. But what he farted, he took to be a vera simianitudinous norm in number and nurture. And so right there in that one crazy poor manteau, 
we get a three-word neologism made up of verisimilitude, meaning the verisimility of his fart being like that of a monkey. And then we get simian right there in the middle, and then the idea of multitudinous. It's just wonderful, and this is not the only example of this kind of feat. But as you'll see in my previous video and my written review, I've gone exhaustively on about the language in here which for me is first and foremost. So for this video, I'm going to try to dive in some facets of the novel that I haven't talked about previously. Let me try to talk about the story just a bit. There are several strands that are going on here. There are three main strands that takes a perspective of a character or pair of characters, and these are interposed throughout the novel. At the same time, there are two pillars, one that's set in the 1800s and one that is set shortly after 9-11 in the very earliest portion of the 21st century. Furthermore, sort of recalling the greatest of Latin American novels, there's a multi-generational epic that's unfolding around these two pillars, around which are raveled these three main strands. So in the 21st century, we are dealing with a pair of college acquaintances in a university town in, I believe, Pennsylvania or New York, in any case, on the, in the Northeast. And they meet each other at this poker game. Donnie is the sort of more conservative, more contemplative, more passive component in this pair, whereas Drake is the son of a billionaire father. He is more dashing in appearance and daring in temperament, and he ends up asking Donnie to come along with them to Belgium for however long they're going to be there. He's very whimsical. He's got money at his disposal. He has a taste for adventure. And so these two fast friends end up taking off and going to Brussels. And so that introduces the pair of friends, Donnie and Drake, in the early 21st century. Both of them tend to have a penchant for globalization or cosmopolitanism, world affairs, and history. Both of them are reading history books. They are talking about different historians on the plane. Between the two of them and the narrator who takes a close omniscient third around them, we get Gibbon, we get Brodel or Brodel, Spangler, Hodgson, Vico, and eventually Herodotus and Thucydides, which are foundations or the bedrock of Western history. And then in the 19th century, we are in the baby America of the fur trade, the California gold rush, the Mexican-American war. On the frontier, we're in the West, and it all kicks off with the white men Hector Robitaille, who gets attacked by a bear and is left by his so-called friends for dead. But he ends up surviving this bear attack, and he makes his way back to Fort Vancouver. These passages, I believe, are my absolute favorites of the entire book, the passages that have to do with Hector's odyssey back toward Fort Vancouver. Now, the idea of an odyssey in this book is interesting on several levels because we're not dealing with Odysseus. We're not even dealing with a character trying to return home necessarily, and furthermore, not dealing with Odysseus trying to return home to Penelope. And we don't have a Telemachus who is at least explicitly trying to go and find his father, Odysseus, who's lost at sea, presumably. 
Harsh wants to even avoid these cliches, and so he spins everything a little bit differently, and I saw it more clearly this time reading it. Last time I did touch on how Odysseus is subverted such that Hector gets his odyssey. And indeed, this is some of the best writing in the book. Some of the most engaging narrative is Hector after this bear attack and being left for dead, making his way this wilderness quest back to home base at Fort Vancouver. And of course, he meets Native Americans along the way. And this commingling of Hector Robitaille and the Native Americans leads to him marrying and having children with a Blackfoot woman. They have a fiery young daughter that they name Marie in Fire, and so she is a mix of red and white. She marries Tom Gravel, who is this white fellow who comes along and takes her away from her family. They have a child named Little Tom Gravel. Little Tom Gravel grows up and marries Ethel, Ethel Gravel, who is one of the most interesting and intelligent and charismatic, charming characters in the whole book. And will indeed get a sort of holistic historiography from Ethel Gravel. In any case, Ethel Gravel, whom we see is called Ma Gravel later on, has a son named Tom that she refers to as a wild son. He marries Adele. They have a son that they also named Tom. Tom marries a woman named Languidia. And this is where the patronymic breaks because the son that they have, they name Donnie, as in Donnie and Drake if I'm following all that generational tree correctly. I keep a generational tree sketched in books like this one that are multi-generational and don't provide a tree, such as some of the later editions of 100 Years of Solitude have in them, or some of the later editions of Wuthering Heights. With this one on both the first and second read, I would jump ahead a little too much and I would fill something into the tree that I'd have to go back and, and strike out and correct. So just hang with it because Harsh doesn't bewilder us. Yes, he does give us this sense of just how long and stretched out this generational cycle is. But this is to the point of the book of what we talk about when we think about manifest destiny or manifold destiny. Towards the very end, at the beginning of a chapter, chapter number 50 of 56, the very first sentence says, What dynastic impulse drives families to continue naming their children after the parents? And you really have to think about this in terms of the question of how much is there really in a name? You'll see that within that tree that starts with Hector Robitaille, and you see how he is this mountain man of the West who survives a bear attack. But then the patronymic changes from him and stays the same generation after generation until one generation before Donnie's, when there's a conscious choice to try to break the pattern or break the chain, break the generational curse, maybe. And so look for the changes not only in the names, of course, but in the patterns of behavior, look at Donnie's temperament versus Hector's versus his father, Tom. So anyhow, you've got that narrative that's rooted in the 1800s. And as that one is going along and the narrative of Donnie and Drake is going along, they will eventually return. They'll be compelled to return home and they'll go all the way west to Las Vegas because they find out that Donnie's father, who heads a top security agency with many, many different secret government contracts, it's called Black Guard, and it's somewhat modeled on what was Blackwater, which is a real institution and something that you can read about. And splintering out of all of the fallout and 
negative impacts of black water. Mandrake Foundling Sr. founds Black Guard and ends up taking in a bunch of the attrition from black water. Black Guard's vision is ostensibly to be a more ethically sound version of what Blackwater was. So this elite security agency, but with principles and standards. But anyhow, Donnie and Drake are confronted in Belgium and compelled to return home because Drake's father and his mother have been killed or assassinated. And so you can almost see, not only in terms of generations progressing and a timeline progressing in a linear fashion, but you can almost chart some of these narratives as directional flights that are constantly pulling toward one another, attracting one another, as in the opposing ends of magnets. Donnie and Drake are pulled back into that west, that region, from the 1800s of Hector Robitaille. And then we flip to the perspective of Eddie Vegas and Tom Garvin. And this will contain some minor spoiler alerts. Like Gravity's Rainbow, I don't think that you can really spoil the manifold destiny of Eddie Vegas. There's just too much going on outside of plot revelations that make the book great to where you can't really ruin it. But in any case, if you're averse to any spoilers, you haven't read this book yet, you can go ahead and skip on a little bit. But we find out that in the present, in the same present of the goings on of Donnie and Drake, we have this starts as what seems like two different characters. And in a sense is two different characters, Eddie Vegas and Tom Garvin. And Tom Garvin, this is Donnie's father, he is the writing teacher, and there's this hilarious workshop scene in a university. But we find out that Tom Garvin's past has been withheld from Donnie. He represents this break in the patronymic chain, and in more ways than just name, also in action and manifesting provision for the future for Donnie and his future successive generations. As this background starts to unfold, we see that there's been some fallout between Tom and Donnie, and their only seeming mutual affinity or common ground that they can unite on is in their hatred of the mother. Languidia, who is this sort of hack job poet who's got a big name on the university campus. And a third quest starts. So our first quest is, of course, survival and lineage propagation in the rough and tumble 1800s. The second quest is Drake and Donnie coming back west to figure out what's going on with these murdered parents. And now the third quest is Tom Garvin trying to find and reconnect with his son. So like I said earlier, this sort of subverting or inverting of the idea of the Odyssey, starting with Homer's Odyssey, is here that we have Odysseus looking for, specifically for, Telemachus. Telemachus is not looking for Odysseus, at least not ostensibly or explicitly. In the course of all this is when we start to get the revelation about these two characters, Eddie Vegas and Tom Garvin, and the name Tom Gravel. We also get the introduction of this very curious character that has a wonderful name, Nordgard. It's spelled with the two A's that represent the A with the, uh, what is this circle? I can't remember. It's uh, the Scandinavian A with the circle that makes that oa sound like uh, Knosgord or Tarje Vesuls or Kierkegaard. And for us native English speakers who aren't familiar with the pronunciation 
of the Scandinavian A with the little circle on top. It usually gets rendered with two A's as in Kierkegaard. And so Nordgard has this look and feel of Nordic Kierkegaard and a guard as in G-A, wait, G-U-A-R-D. Yes, he also happens to be a dwarf and he presents himself as Drake's father's right-hand man who always stayed hidden and mysterious. He's sort of this invisible hand of the whole Blackguard operation. He was his father's advisor. He was constantly setting things up and he just has this crazy commando attitude and, and temperament. He's referred to as that odd creature Nordgard with his tales of outlandish camaraderie. Nordgard is a very curious speaker. He says low all the time and he adds a, a sinister tension until the unfortunate ending. Now, I was thinking about the characters in this book and all the different pairings. And I happened to be washing the car the other day and listening to this wonderful podcast called Reading McCarthy. And it was an episode where they were talking about women characters in McCarthy, specifically about the fact that McCarthy doesn't have many well-rounded, three-dimensional female characters. And he has been recorded as saying that he doesn't know how to write female characters. And this is also what is making everyone highly anticipate the forthcoming Stella Maris. But in any case, a couple of things were said that were really interesting to me, especially in terms of how they highlighted the Manifold Destiny of Eddie Vegas for me. One of the main things that they talked about was they cued off of the concept of these homosocial triangles in René Girard's Deceit, Desire in the novel. Now, I don't think Girard calls them homosocial, but he does open up this wonderful book with the idea of these triangles where there are two male characters and one of them is trying to get an object, but they can only get that object or achieve that object mediated through another male, a male companion. And he uses all kinds of wonderful triangles throughout literature, notably Cervantes' use in Don Quixote and Proust in his great epic. And I saw here that this is largely a homosocial novel. It's a novel of fathers and sons and male friends and male friends, male companionship. And there are two main homosocial triangles that stand out to me. One is the triangle of Tom Garvin and his son, Donnie Garvin, with that female. And in fact, the wife of the one and the mother of the other, Languidia. And so this is interesting again, because this is a non-edible triangle. Donnie isn't united with Languidia and, you know, hating the father and wanting to kill the father to have sex with the mother. No, Garvin is trying to get closer to Donnie. Both of them are trying to get away from the other. So there's this common third point that is being used to ultimately mediate and bring together in a homosocial contract, the father and the son. There's also Drake and Donnie and Satif. This is the young girl that they meet in Belgium and that they both sort of fall for. But Donnie is passive and sort of relinquishes or withholds his explicit pursuit in favor of Drake. And this is a point where, whereas Tom and Donnie are uni united in their opposition to that third female point. Here, Donnie and Drake are united in their mutual affection for the third point. I think there are other triangles going on here, but it does lend an overall shape or geometry to some of the prevailing themes of what can be called homo socialism, or no, that doesn't sound good that makes it too political, like socialism, but this uh, homosocial need between male characters, male character pairs in the book. 
But that's not to say that all of the female characters are simply fodder for these male relationships. Right from the beginning with the Blackfoot woman who marries Hector Robitaille and Marie Fire in Flight. And then finally, like I said earlier, Ma Gravel or Ethel Gravel. She is the first female owner of a taxi company there in Nevada, in Virginia City, Nevada. And she grows this into a big business. And then she has the foresight to see that as things are expanding and highways are starting to be built in America, she jumps into the transportation business. She is extremely learned because of her insatiable hunger for knowledge, especially knowledge of history and the world. The narrator refers to her free-ranging thoughts with their thousands of facts, compelled her to restless efforts at historiography, resulting in a private macaronicon. I love the way this book is written. But we actually get a peek for the next five or six pages. We get a peek at these thousands of facts and this restless effort at historiography resulting in this private macaronicon. We get to view the outside as in a museum of the mind of this macaronicon. And so it's not that Harsh can't write a good, compelling, likable female character. It's just simply that that's not what this book is about. And yet where it gets really interesting as I was thinking through the concept of these triangles from Girard, Harsh does step in and offer a relational geometry, but it's not a triangle, it's a rectangle. In Vegas, we've got Drake and Satif together, and we've got Donnie and Hermione. Hermione is this woman who's, I think, about twice his age that he meets in some bar, and they end up really meshing well together. And they emerge from their hotel room and come into contact with Drake and Satif together. And so the two pairs are now looking at each other. And the narrator sees them as a rectangular geometry with four points that he labels A, B, C, and D. A was the cornerstone of this geometric configuration, the most surprising reference point. And A is in fact Satif, whom, as I said, both Drake and Donnie fall for. And then for two or three pages, we dig in to the relational dynamics of this rectangle. It's utterly fascinating and extends beyond the limitations of these triangles as I've defined them just a moment ago. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this video up by giving you two things that still stood out to me and that I haven't totally parsed through. One comes from very near the end of the book on page 577 here in the Zero Gram Press edition. It says, the devil not only exists, but romps rampant among us. We've seen him many times in this very book. And I underlined that and again put a little exclamation mark out in the margin, just as I did in my previous editions of this novel, because I think that's something that just is dropped out there for us to pursue. What does he mean by the devil that we've seen many times in this very book? Are these the political figures behind some of the biggest atrocities in history? Are they the drones or the drone strikes or the, the hands on the joystick behind those remote drone strikes that have killed civilians? Is it the antagonist, the Fitz, Patrick Fitz, 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 Packer? Is it the Fitz Packer who becomes the nemesis of Hector Robitaille? Is it Blackguard or the Drake behind Blackguard before he's murdered? Is it Nordgard? And the other is this whole element of Drake Jr. being obsessed with footage of the Twin Tower strikes on 9-11. He watches footage from all different angles that he collects or curates, and he is obsessively trying to 
understand something about the essence of experience. And even when his new friend Donnie watches this perverse activity and tries to offer to Drake that he's actually being counterintuitive if he's trying to understand something novel and fresh about the essence of experience by watching this stuff over and over again. The law of diminishing marginal utility states that he's basically going to get numb to uh, and bored with the footage he's watching. But Drake has a really interesting counter-argument. Both of those things have really stood out to me and make me curious about what's going to happen when I read this book for the third time. I hope that you found this companion video to my earlier video of The Manifold Destiny of Eddie Vegas useful. I can honestly, sincerely tell you that reading this a second time was even more fulfilling and engaging. I mean, honestly, exhilarating than the first time. And in a year, in a couple of years, I'm going to be picking this up again. And again, this one is out now from Zero Gram Press. I will put the link to order your copy in the description of this video.